For the range safety rules and practices, we're under section eight now of your binders, safety rules and practices, and also go over the ballistics survey that we did as well as the same survey report. The range safety rules and practices are extremely important. The official range safety rules and practices document was submitted in its entirety to the uh, commission. In addition to the submission of that document, we're going to take a little bit uh, more in-depth look at our safety rules and practices and apply them. Whoops. What did I do? So a good look at this is a safety analysis. One of the great concerns in any activity involving the use of firearms is safety. It's of uh, utmost paramount importance. At Founders Ranch, the safety of our shooters, spectators, and neighbors is, in, is absolutely the highest priority. We make every effort to ensure that all shooting is directed to a safe and designated area. The impact area is designed to ensure that no bullet injures a participant and no bullet will ever leave the property. presentation will include the following, a brief discussion of exterior ballistics including maximum range of various pistols and rifle ammunition, the physical attributes of the shooting areas themselves affecting bullet containment, and policies and procedures to ensure that bullet containment. We'll also do a comparison of Founders Ranch's supervised shooting area to what we call a rogue open shooting area. Uh, that is slightly north and east of the ranch. Ballistics is basically the science of the motion of a projectile. Exterior ballistics are the branch of that science that deals with the projectile after it clears the muzzle of whatever's launching it throughout its time in flight. Ballistics can become quite complicated, and I'll make a little note here of that Calculated ballistics are not 100% accurate. The most accurate ballistics are done by observation. That is, you launch the projectile and see where it lands. You can, you can mathematically track the uh, trajectory, that is the path that the bullet is going to take once it is fired. If we were firing it in a vacuum without gravity, you launch a bullet at a 45 degree angle, it will travel the farthest, and that is easily calculatable. So with no air and no gravity, if we were shooting in outer space, the trajectory of the projectile fired under those conditions will be a straight line, and it will continue forever unless it is acted on by some other force. This little diagram basically indicates that if you were to fire a bullet, and the only forces that we dealt with would be the muzzle velocity and the gravity, the bullet path would be a perfect traject, perfect parabola. Its impact strike would be exactly at the same angle as it leaves the rifle or other firing mechanism. Its al highest altitude reach would be half its distance, again, a perfect parabola. However, We don't live in a vacuum. Now, here on Earth, upon leaving the muzzle, the bullet encounters air resistance. The air resistance has a significant effect on the trajectory and range. The maximum range that a bullet will reach will be a function of muzzle velocity, the coefficient of uh, the ballistic coefficient of the projectile, which in turn is a function of the shape and size of the bullet, and the additional force of the acceleration of gravity. In air, normal conditions, the air resistance will reduce the distance the bullet will travel. Uh, it is no longer, the maximum distance is no longer a 45 degree angle, it's closer to 30. It will always, the angle of fall will always be steeper than the angle at which you shoot. 
and the striking velocity that is the velocity that it still carries when it strikes the ground will be far less than the initial velocity. The maximum ordinate, that is the uh, maximum height that the bullet will travel, will be approximately two-thirds the distance of its range. And that's illustrated. Note that this, under typical conditions, note that's no longer a perfect parabola. Now this table is a little hard to read. My formatting expert kind of made it difficult for all of us. But in general, it's more readable in your documents there. Uh, it is a selected, it's a selected sample of various calibers of handgun and rifle ammunition. Those items that are highlighted are calculated trajectories. They are calculated, adjusted for altitude. The higher the altitude, the thinner the air, the farther the bullet will travel. Those that are not highlighted are taken directly from the Navy's observations of maximum distances. For those of you who are unfamiliar with firearms, rifle and handgun bullets are solid projectiles. They're fired one projectile at a time. Shotgun ammunition consists of numerous tiny spherical pellets. They exit the muzzle of the firearm all at once. Round pellets are terribly ballistically uh, inefficient, and consequently they travel much shorter distances than bullets do. There's a brief chart. It's included in your, uh, in your package. Uh, on the shotgun range, the largest shot size, and, and, and note that the larger the number, the smaller the shot. Consequently, the least, the lesser distance it will travel. The largest shot size allowed on our shotgun range is seven and a half. The largest range, the largest shot allowed on the general range is number fours. From the shot, from the chart up there, you can see that size seven and a half shot. Its maximum distance is about 750 feet. Let's talk about cowboy matches, cowboy ammunition. The maximum muzzle velocity allowed uh, for pistols is 1,000 feet per second. The maximum for rifle is 14,000 feet per, or 1,400 feet per second. I don't want to shoot one at 14,000. Because in cowboy, targets are up close, generally within 10 to 50 yards at most. Uh, there is no advantage in using a maximum muzzle velocity. Consequently, the vast majority of shooters use muzzle velocities that fall somewhere between 450 and 800 feet per second. We have a brief chart showing what the maximum distance a cowboy load using maximum velocities would travel. And what I did was take two representative, uh, the most common firearms that we would see in a cowboy a 38 and a 45 caliber round fired at maximum velocity you can see that about 1.1 miles is the furthest fired at a 30 degree angle that they would ever travel that's at max the table below shows what an average 650 foot per second muscle velocity would travel which is about seven tenths of a mile fired at a 30 degree angle. And by the way, I chose the best ballistic coefficients I could find for those particular uh, bullets. Let's look at the layout of the range a little bit. Founders Ranch is a 480 acre rectangle. It's one mile north to south, three quarters of a mile east to west, and the shooting area consists of 17 bays located on the east side in the northern half of the property. If you can see that, the shooting range is designated there on the left hand side slightly above the uh, center and you can see the semicircle of bays. The reason that's in a semicircle is we want the shooting direction from each bay to be into the center of the mountain behind the bays. 
Each bay is oriented toward the peak of the mountain along the eastern border of the property. The mountain rises 200 feet above the floor of the bays, and it acts as our backstop to prevent a shooter from shooting outside the boundaries of the ranch. The distance from the beginning of the berm, or the bay rather, to the top of the mountain is 490 yards. So we've got a, a triangle that is 490 yards long to the top of the hill, and that hill is 200 feet above the shooting position. Each bay is bounded by earthen berms. They're approximately 10 to 12 feet high. The berms are extended down each side of the bay to form a three-sided box. The construction of the shooting bays are earthen berms. They're designed to contain any bullet fired within their confines. Uh, if you want to do a brief exercise here, the, the height of the ceiling is what, 12 feet? 14? 20? How about the height of that bookcase, which is about 10? Maximum. Okay. Imagine standing in this room and trying to shoot above the clock. And there's a mountain behind you. You cannot shoot to the sides because the wall blocks you. You can only shoot in that direction. That forces the bullets to wind, to wind up at the end of the berm and remain contained within the confines of the shooting area. You couple that with the safety procedures, which are covered in, in greater depth in, your, in the presentation that you have, and the policies of Founders Ranch, the likelihood of a bullet leaving the ranch is extremely small. Members of the public, if they're allowed to shoot, are only shot, only allowed to shoot in designated areas. We don't allow people to run around the ranch shooting in various directions. And they are only allowed to shoot under the supervision of a trained range on safety officer. And as trained range safety officers, we are taught to stay close to the shooter, watch what he's doing, prevent him from doing anything stupid before he can. No rifle or pistol barrel may be oriented above the horizontal while loading or chambering around. The reason for that is the most likely case of an accidental discharge is during loading the firearm. If the muzzle is level, pointed toward the end of the berm, and the individual loading the firearm has his finger on the trigger, and the gun goes off, it can only go into the designated impact area. The muzzle must be pointed into a safe, designated area while loading. If the range officer were to observe you doing otherwise, you will be politely asked and firmly convinced that you should leave the range. We place our targets as near the back of the berm as practicable, depending upon which shooting discipline and whether we're shooting paper or steel, so that we reduce the possibility of muzzle elevation great enough to shoot over the mountain. As we get closer to the back of the berm, it requires you to raise the, the, point, the muzzle level to absurd levels in order to be able to shoot over the top of the mountain. As Misty mentions, uh, we, will, we're allow, we wish to allow uh, CCW classes. Concealed carry classes will be conducted only by state certified instructors, and they are very aware and they agree to abide by all of, the, all of our range rules. At the shotgun range, uh, we're dealing with all those little tiny spears that don't travel very far. Still, we engage all targets inward toward the center of the property. That ensures that in no way can a shotgun pellet leave the property. Again, no shot larger than seven and a half uh, is used, and all of our safety, the angles between shooting stations and where we're shooting birds, are calculated on a, di on, a, on a distance of at least 330 yards, which is far greater than the distance seven and a half shot will travel. If we find somebody with a shot greater than uh, of a larger size than seven and a half on the uh, shotgun range, they will be asked to leave and never come back. No shooter wants to be subjected to 
shotgun pellets raining down upon them. All actions and, of shotguns are open and empty at all times until they're in the shooter's hand, in the box, ready to call for a target. Mr. Baker, can yes, I sir. ask you to hold on a minute while we change the disc? Okay, Mr. Baker. Ready? Okay. Uh, in just want to highlight a few of the um, general policies and procedures under general rules. You do have them in your presentation. Uh, no unsupervised shooting is allowed on the range. No one is allowed to shoot alone. We don't even allow the owners to shoot by themselves. There must be two people on the range to shoot. All shooting is directed at a designated impact area. If the proposed public shooters are under supervision of a trained or range safety officer at all times. They're not allowed to just come out and shoot without having someone observe the safety procedures. A basic rule is you keep the finger off the trigger and the action open until the firearm is pointed downrange at the target you wish to shoot at. Again, it reduces the possibility of a bullet escaping the property. If a shot should impact above the 12 or 15 foot berm at the back of the shooting bay, the shooter is immediately disqualified and members of the public who were to do that are immediately dismissed from the property. Again, we don't want someone elevating that muzzle to that 30 degree angle. A loaded firearm pointed in an unsafe direction is grounds for immediate removal from the property. Uh, we haven't had to do that very often, but we have upon occasion. All actions, any firearm, is kept open and empty until you are ready to fire it. Let's look at the unsupervised area, which is, and there are many unofficial unsupervised shooting areas within the county. There is one highly used area uh, located east of the northeast corner of the ranch. Uh, various people have visited the area, evidence of incendiary targets, uh, such as propane tanks, uh, is present. Evidence of alcohol consumption is present. And you can tell by looking at the targets, what's left of them, as you look around the area in which they're shooting, that it's rather indiscriminate. It's in all directions. If you can see that, that red area that you see represents a 3.8 mile circle, radius circle. From that shooting area, that is the possible impact area should a round escape from the area that they're shooting in now. And that's only that one area. We're not, I did not include any of the other areas that we have, we've seen unsupervised shooting. You'll see that there is a yellow line extending oh, to about one o'clock from the range and it's very narrow. That is if all other safety procedures and our backstop fail, that is the possible impact if a bullet were to leave the proposed public shooting area. The little blue fan shape area there, that's the area if we were to use maximum velocity cowboy loads, that is the possible area if all other safety uh, procedures fail where a bullet could impact. And that's only the maximum. I did not calculate for a minimum. The minimum would be is, is a little, little tiny piece. So if you take a look at the possible danger, the possible impact area from the open shooting area, take a look at the possible remotely possible areas of the, of the supervised range area, 
It is readily apparent that Founders Ranch is a safer alternative to the free fire zone unsupervised shooting area. Let's move on to noise. Firearms are loud. They make a lot of noise. So we took a sound level survey and they were measured at selected locations near Founders Ranch. A calibrated IE standard, IEC standard of 651 type 2 digital sound level meter with a sensitivity of 0.1 dB and an accuracy of plus or minus a half, one and a half dB using A frequency rating was used to take the sound readings. Let me make a note on A frequency rating, A frequency uh, weighting is what that should say. A frequency weighting is a means of making the digital meter respond in exactly the same way that your ear responds to sound. Wind speed readings were taken on the days that we took the sound levels and the instrument used was a Brunton handheld digital anemometer. Wow, I can't see that, can you? Uh, <laughs> we took sound level readings. Uh, I used the five stand at the shotgun range as my baseline reading, just to establish a zero. No one was shooting at the time. There was a cowboy match going on that day at the uh, at the regular range, and so we used shots from there, fired from there, as again our baseline noise level. The other area, since it's not very readable, we're at the corner of Barton Road and Juan Tomas, at the corner of Twilight and Juan Tomas, and just a little bit further east, there's a little valley there, which is absolutely opposite the shooting base. We took a reading there. I took a run, another reading at the very beginning of the mountain valley where it, where it uh, turns east from uh, twilight. Two readings further down in the valley, and I took two readings east of the mountain that separates us from Edgewood. So on December 2nd, readings were obtained during a cowboy action shooting match and we had a five stand practice session going at the Clays range. On December 3rd, there was no, there were no one shooting at the range, and so we established some reference readings. We took an AR-15 and 223, we took a 30 out 6 hunting rifle, and a 12 gauge shotgun. And each of those firearms were fired, two shots each, approximately uh, two seconds apart, and then the next gun was fired, and then the next gun was fired, while I took readings at these various positions. Subsequent readings were obtained in the same manner. We moved our reference firearms uh, to the open shooting area northeast of the range. In each instance, at each location, what we did was first measure the wind speed. And then we took minimum and maximum ambient sound readings. Uh, so that we had some sort of range within which to work and a reference for the background. Then by a radio or cell phone, the order to fire was given <coughs> and we recorded the peak sound level readings of the shots that were fired. The results are tabulated in tables and graphs that show at the end of the presentation. What we found was that the ambient noise level on those particular days, very widely, from around the mid 30 dB range at zero wind movement to as much as 70 dB, and that's just the noise from the wind blowing through the trees. In many cases, the sound of the gunfire could be heard, but not measured. I could not see a peak above the background noise. <coughs> In each case, the effect was noted, and the lowest ambient reading was recorded. In other words, if I could hear it, uh, but I couldn't measure it, I took the lowest ambient reading, simply because to place a zero in the table or a blank would have both been wrong, and it would have given a, given a very misleading uh, graph. In some cases, the gunfire could neither be heard nor measured. 
The effect was noted at that particular location and a value of 3 dB less than whatever my minimum reading was, was inserted for the, for the sound value of the gunfire. 3 dB was chosen because that is the sound level in which the ear would notice the increase in volume or decrease in volume. In all cases, the gunfire from the ranch resulted in sound levels less than the maximum ambient sound level. Sometimes it was more than the minimum ambient sound level. It was never more than the maximum. Cowboy action shooting and the Clay's range results were generally either not measurable or they were inaudible. If they were measurable, they were only one or two dB above the minimum ambient level. Gunfire from rifle and shotgun at base 16 was generally above the minimum ambient, but not more than the maximum ambient sound levels. In all cases, the sound levels from gunfire on the ranch at each of those locations measured was less than 55 dB. The maximum reading was just over 50. 50.1 if I remember. Sound levels of gunfire from the open shooting area to the east of the ranch were generally louder than the same gunfire from Founders Ranch. The sound levels exceeded the maximum ambient level at one location on the east side of the mountain by approximately 8 dB. It's a huge increase with a reading of 51 dB. It was still under 55. The sound level was either audible but not measurable or it was not audible at all in two locations south of the property. So that means south of the ranch. So what did we learn? We learned that windy conditions can raise the ambient noise level by a significant amount and that it may also affect the level of sound perceived or measured at the loca various locations. We also realized that the berms in the shooting bays along with the mountain behind the bay serve to absorb at least some of the gunfire noise that's taking place within the bay. In some locations, the sound of gunfire could be heard but not measured. So that would mean, yeah, it's about the ambient noise level. In no case was the sound level greater than 51 dB. In general, it appears, at least in some locations, the loudest gunfire may well be heard from areas other than Founders Ranch. The Environmental Protection Agency states that levels of 55 decibels outdoors and 45 decibels indoors are identified as preventing activity causing interference and annoyance. Anything lower than these levels of noise are considered those which will permit spoken conversation and other activities such as sleeping, working, recreation, which are part of the daily human condition. Founders Ranch, based on this survey, is well within those parameters, or at least on those two days that we took measurements. Table one, uh, I'm not going to run all through all this, you can uh, review them as you wish, uh, but it's just a recording of the measurements taken. The graph I found interesting, the red line is the maximum shooting decibels, the light blue line is the maximum ambient sound. The yellow line is the minimum, and I note that the shooting, this is from the cowboy action match, is right along in line with the minimum ambient background noise on that day. Again, these are our reference shots, no need to look at those, but here's the graph of what those sounds gave you. Again, the light blue line is the maximum background noise, the yellow line is the minimum background noise, and that purple line was the recorded sounds of the shotgun, rifle, and AR-15 at the proposed public shooting day. And let me back up just a moment. 
Note the wind velocities that are recorded at the bottom, the minimum and maximum wind speeds. The sound levels rise both. Uh, it seems to influence the sound because it rises. The ambient noise level goes up every peak that we have uh, for the wind speed. These are measurements taken shooting the same firearms from the open shooting area. And we'll note the same thing. Ambience is much greater than, in most cases, is greater than the sound from the shotguns. And this is just a tabulation of uh, comparisons. The red line on this graph is the sh recorded sound levels of shooting from the open area. The blue is cowboy rounds. And then the red, or kind of light red there, is the maximum <coughs> sounds from the proposed public shooting bay. It's rather obvious that the park area creates louder sounds from the firearms than the range does. Table 5 common sound levels that is included in your package. Uh, however, I don't have a slide for it because it's like a humongous file. Uh, so I just selected a couple of things. And this is from the uh, Centers for Hearing and Communication. And I'm getting old. I'm going to go to the glasses. All right. Zero is the softest sound that a person can hear if you have normal hearing. 20 dB represents whispering at five feet. 60 dB is normal conversation. And one of the, you know, I have a list here of various things that the CAC put out. This average sound of a refrigerator in your home is 50 dB. And they showed an electric toothbrush as between 50 and 60 dB. I don't know how many of you use one of those, but I read that. And I went, oh, I didn't think it was that loud. We went in the bathroom this morning, turned on the electric <laughs> toothbrush, and sure enough, it measured 64 dB. <laughs> a lot louder than I thought it was. Uh, normal TV audio is 70 decibels. For, for those of us with normal hearing. A doorbell runs about 80. A chainsaw, where did I remember seeing it here somewhere? The chainsaw was 120 decibels. So if you're operating a chainsaw, please wear ear protection. It will make you 